uh, Dr. Cyber, uh, the mm -hmm. first question is, there is now, today in the Middle East, there is a lot of civil wars, wars mm -hmm. here and here. People, they don't admit it's civil, it's civil wars because each uh, side think he is represent God and he is in fight mm -hmm. uh, in holy war to establish uh, the God states. In, in immediate history, uh, is there any similar situation? And if so, how is it end? Because people right now, they don't know how is this yeah. big misery is go going to end. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> for us here in the West, the question is how we make some sense out of this because it sounds very much chaotic or anarchic what is going on in Syria or in uh, the other countries around. So we have developed in the West a critical theory of religion mm. um, in which we concentrate particularly on the dichotomy or the antagonism between modernity and religion. Mm -hmm. Not only Islam but also Christianity because they have had a very similar history. So there was violence and war also in the background of Islam, but also of Christianity. And our idea is if the religions can learn from each other. So if Christians see the turmoil in the Near East and the wars and so on, they can remember that they had that too in the West. They were Protestant and Catholics fighting each other for 300 years, mm -hmm. devastating all of Europe as it is now devastated in the Near East. And um, so they finally came out of this only by um, separating religion and state, for instance. So the question is, can our Islamic brothers and sisters learn something from the suffering which we went through here in the, in the West? Nice. So there are many reasons why the different groups, the Sunnis and the Shiites and so on, are fighting with each other. But I think that behind all of it, there is the issue of secularization. That means that the West has separated itself from the medieval system. Mm -hmm. In the medieval system, you had the clergy up there and the nobility, and uh, there was a, a hierarchical order. Mm -hmm. And then modernity means that different systems and subsystems are differentiated, have become functional units to each other. And that is something very different now because religion becomes one factor in this system. It becomes one subsystem. Mm -hmm. Religion is not sitting up there like in a theocracy, right? That's what you said. God rules everything, the theocracy. We have it in Iran at least, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe Iraq tries to do it. It's not there everywhere, but uh, there are tendencies toward this, um, toward this theocracy. Yeah, they say kalimatullahi al I mean, the word of God is the highest. Right, So they yeah. apply the word of God. Yeah. And the clergy then, on, on the uh, ulama and so on, the lawyers mm -hmm. translate it then and, and so on. So in this sense, it is a theocracy. But I mean, you have in Iran a French constitution, a modern constitution practically. Mm -hmm. You have in, in Iraq also an American constitution in a certain sense. So, um, so, but it is this antagonism which helps us to get some clarity into what is happening there. There are many other factors, but this factor between religion on one side and on the other side, this modernization, this differentiation of subsystems, like the family and like civil society and the state and then religion becomes one subsystem among many others and so on. So that seems to be the whole uh, uh, struggle mm -hmm. and that some Islamic groups are more open toward the West and others are more closed up yes. and they become then antagonists in themselves. So the, what we have since the Renaissance and since the Reformation, this differentiation there was a differentiation before between the secular and the profane and the sacred and the profane, but it was not antagonistic, it was not hostile. That has happened only in the West, mm -hmm. and that is uh, unique, you see, and what is unique is so difficult to grasp. There were beginnings in, in China, they invented gunpowder and so on, but they didn't make much of it. There was a beginning with uh, locomotives in Greece, but they didn't make much out of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so modernity started somewhere, but it didn't take off. But in the West, it took off. And that is the core of the problem. It's the core of the problem for the Christians, for the Jews, for the Islamic people. It's the thing which they have in common. 
And as this spread into India, this modernity, mm -hmm. it became a problem also for the Buddhists and for the Shindris and so on and so on. But, so it's globalized now, the okay. whole problem. So, but this structure, this type of thought is important to get some sense into the facts. And this is that we have this antagonism, but as we have it between the religion and the secular, it splits the religious groups in themselves and they become antagonistic to each other. Mm -hmm. So in the West, the Protestants were the first way how Christianity adjusted to modernity. The Catholics remained much more modern, much more stubborn. You can see that in Ireland last week, mm -hmm. uh, Ireland votes for uh, gay marriages and the Vatican says this is a defeat for humanity. The, you have you know, this stubborn issue there. We have the book Leviticus, we have the book Genesis, we have uh, St. Paul, uh, that uh, homosexuals are atheists, uh, comes from atheism. There's the whole natural law tradition and that is all against it. So there you have this religious, stubborn religious position mm -hmm. and Catholicism has it still. But the Protestant groups have become more relaxed, more open and so on. So that is the fundamental thesis. There is this antagonism, and this antagonism splits the religious people, mm -hmm. but it also splits the modern people. So that in the Enlightenment people, you have genuine enlightenment, and you have some ideological enlightenment, which is very dangerous, which would, should reject. But the question is, is it possible for our um, Islamic brothers and sisters to look at this enlightenment if they can accept some of it or so that can there be an enlightened islam besides a fundamentalist is islam okay this is will lead me to another question do you think the the religion is the cause of this wars like many atheists including richard dawkins yeah. in his book yeah. god delusion he claims that the religion is the cause yeah well we usually, in the critical theory of religion, we have a multi-factor type of a theory. Mm -hmm. I think that there are economic factors. There was colonialism. There, even in post-colonialism, you know, the West still wants to have that oil. Uh, instead of, you know, trading it, they want to own it. Mm -hmm. Like they want to have rubber in Vietnam, you know. They want to have coffee in El Salvador and so on. So this post-colonial thing, this robbery, you know, is still at work. So I think there is a, an economic factor. Okay. Um, so there it's is more a than so religion. There fact. is a social factor. There is a class factor, you know. There are the rich and then there are the masses of the poor and, and so on. So um, there are different uh, psychological factors, sociological factors, and one of them may also be the religious factor. Mm -hmm. And that is what we concentrate on, you know, because I think that the religious factor has to be, Hawkins is right in that, that the religious factor uh, factors in, definitely, right? But I don't know if he differentiates, for instance, between good and bad religion, you know, which is part of the Western tradition. Uh, uh, Marx, you know, said uh, the opium religion, you know, mm. but many people say, well, that is the bad Marx who said this, you know. But he learned it from his teacher Hegel, who thought the Hindus, you know, the Hinduism was opiate. But then it comes really from Immanuel Kant, the greatest enlightener of the West, who would say that bad religion is one which makes you feel good, but it blinds you, blinds your conscience. Nice. So that you can happily live side by side with slums, you know, and with food stamps and with no health insurance and so on and so on, mm. and your conscience says nothing. So that is bad religion, you know. So uh, uh, which religion in this country uh, uh, opposed, for instance, when under Bush then suddenly uh, uh, torture was introduced, water boarding again, mm. which by, was, by the way, an invention of the Holy Inquisition, and then the SS in Germany, fascism, took it over, and then the CIA took it over. So, um, but where were the churches who stood up and said this is not, should not be done? See, that would be the, the function which religion can still have. That okay. they would say this, we came, we evolved to that point where we knew that this was against the dignity of every human being to torture him or to waterboarding and so on. And we don't do this anymore, you know. Okay. And suddenly, unilaterally, we did it again. And we are ashamed of it now. We have our own self-criticism, thanks be to God. 
there is self-criticism in the United States. So is, 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 is this <coughs> because sometimes I think that the United States more care about the human rights inside the United States. When we get out, yeah. it's, it's totally different. Well, it is outright hypocritical in a certain sense, right? It's mm. hypocrisy. Uh, only you could say it's not so much hypocrisy because some people don't even know the norms anymore. So if you are a hypocrite, mm -hmm. you have to know what is right, and then you pretend to do the right, and you do the opposite. But if you don't know anymore what's right, then you cannot really be a hypo 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 hypocrite <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Right? So, but yes, I mean, it is hypocritical, nevertheless, to say, you know, to talk about uh, human rights violations in China or whatever, while we have our race problem here, you know, which, mm. which violates, you know, all standards of human rights. So um, uh, that is, that's true. So, but um, let's, in order to not to lose ourselves all the time, let's see that we go back to what the core of the whole thing is. So the question, you know, for instance, of these human rights, mm -hmm. all these decisions about homosexuality and so on are done against all three Abrahamic religions. We have to have that very clear. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes in the States we are a little bit wishy-washy about these things. But we cannot come to a reconciliation uh, of the antagonism. What we want, we want to reconcile. We want to have peace in the end. Mm -hmm. In order to have that, we have to see the antagonisms uh, clearly. Uh, so, so these human rights declarations of the 18th century, the bourgeois enlightenment, and then the socialist enlightenment, and so on. So they judge these things today on the basis of these human rights declarations, we are all equal. Therefore, everybody has the same rights. Mm. Therefore, everybody has the right to get married. <laughs> Therefore, they can get married and so on. That is how the secular people uh, uh, judge. And it is important that this is a new way of ethos, a new way of ethics to deal with us. And it happens every day. We have 19 states now which uh, 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 affirm uh, the, the uh, same-sex marriage and so on. And uh, in Europe, we have it all over the place already, So, yeah. except Russia, you know. Russia has problems now. With the, the, uh, the Putin was just with the Pope, and Putin sees himself now standing up for traditional values, uh, so, which is a, which is a peculiar type of a development. So, nevertheless, but the very fact, you know, that millions of people come from the Near East mm -hmm. to the West, because they want to find work, Freedom. but be also because they enjoy the rights here too, you know. Mm -hmm. So even those people who attacked on September 11th, you know, they studied in Hamburg, you know, they studied engineering in Hamburg. Mm -hmm. So people come because there are some things in the West which are attractive and which are good. Yes. So, and that is one element in this whole uh, process, you know. So while some people, uh, Muslims, are open to some extent for the West, hopefully critically open, right? others are frightened of this. And there is a good reason why, it is fri why they are frightened. Because the Western Enlightenment, something went wrong with it. We call that the dialectic of enlightenment. The enlightenment means to free people from their fears and to make them into masters of their fate. Okay. Or it means where it is, the will to life, ego should be. Or where things are unconscious, they should be made conscious. That is the Enlightenment. But the Enlightenment became positivistic and turned against itself to some extent. So then we have not only secularity, uh, affirmative attitude toward the world, which you have in Islam and in Christianity too, but we have secularism. And secularism is a negative form of the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And there people are, religious people, are rightly opposing this. Um, let me give an example. Online I have 40 people and they all don't know what positivism is, in spite of the fact that they're all positivists. A positivist is somebody who has a metaphysics of what is the case. So he studies the facts and the data and uh, then uh, uh, makes statistics about it. And that is all wonderful. Mm -hmm. They have done wonderful things. But then they somehow don't differentiate between good facts and bad facts. And they treat them almost equally. 
And when there is something bad, then they say, well, the class is still half full. Or they say all the time, it is as it is. Mm -hmm. And then positivism makes us adjust to the evil things, the unjust things, like torture. Uh, or this, uh, with these automatic airplanes, assassin people every week and so on. So then, see, then the, the conscious conscience is blinded and that is bad religion then. So you have good and bad religion, but you also have good and bad enlightenment. Yes. And religious people can work together and fight against this bad enlightenment. But the question is if we should not um, think if we can do something about the good enlightenment namely the human rights tradition um, or this whole problem you know of uh, um, of building secular states states which are neutral toward religion mm -hmm. these were not bad people who did this you know mm -hmm. so the bourgeoisie the third estate in the west which rules this country so not the first estate the clergy or the nobility or so but the third estate which made all these revolutions they found themselves in the same situation which you have now in the Near East. And the question was, you know, how do we get out of this mess? There was the so-called Westphalian peace and so on. So they, after 30 years of religious wars, you know, and killing and butchering and so on, and there was almost no, no village standing anymore in, in, in Europe, you know. Mm -hmm. Then the, slowly the secular state was developed. Religion was taken out of the state and was put into civil society. It became private. It became like a private corporation, privatization. And every Islamic heart, you know, may be frightened of this because when you do that, you privatize religion, <coughs> then does that mean that religion has no entrance anymore into the public sphere? That religion cannot determine anymore what happens in the family. So that they say religion should stay out of the family, out of civil society, out of economics, out of international politics, and Islam is holistic. Every religion, great religion, is holistic. It wants to embrace the whole life and not only be in the heart. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, when we hear this, you know, they took religion out of the state and put it, we did that here with the colonies and so on, put it then in civil society, we privatize it and so on. Is that not destructive? So religious people may be frightened but, of the destructiveness but, of this. I've heard the question. And before <coughs> this question, let, let's return it back to the Middle East. Right now, today, there's wars. Do you think if uh, this war is, is, is also because the theocratic, theocratic states, like Saudi Arabia, Iran, there, like if, if we imagine those two states are uh, more secular or mm -hmm. more far away from the mm -hmm. claims that they are uh, mm -hmm. that states, yeah. do you think this will eliminate these wars or something like this? Um, because we talk about people, people they want, let's say people they want to be more tolerant, more yeah. secular. But how, how we can adjust that if their government, mm -hmm. who control everything, is a, claim it's theocratic states? Yeah. Well, the question is, you know, if theocracy can really still be done. Let's take Iran, for instance. Um, it cannot be avoided that in Iran, a third estate, that means the bourgeoisie develops. Young people who don't want to have the kingdom of God as the, go of the goal of politics, mm -hmm. but they want to have a happy life as the goal of politics. Mm -hmm. So then there comes a split, you know, where a generation grows up who may not be anti-religious or whatever, but they want to have housing and food and education and want to travel and they want to have the happy life which they think the people in the West have. Mm. And uh, so, and that will be a, a strong power then. And so, but it must not lead, you know, to, to the end of religion or whatever. Um, there are sometimes in nature, there are forces which are in opposition, but they also support each other. So it could be, you know, that people, the, that the goal of uh, politics is really a good life, a secular life, but that on the other hand, the coming of the kingdom as Jews or Christians and, and, and so on would say, or the coming of the Messiah, that this is a quiet process which could come very well at the same time. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, happy conditions, you know, could be a preparation of this kingdom of God or whatever we want to call it, or the New Jerusalem, the mm -hmm. Jews call it, and, and so on. So. So therefore, they are somehow opposed, you know, 
when we say politics is not the kingdom of God, that's theocracy, but the goal of politics is a good and just life in society, that is opposed to some extent, but it also may support each other. So something like compromises like this, you know, we would have to think about. But I don't think that theocracies really have a future. Yeah, me, me too. Yeah. But the question here, okay, theocracy is there. Yeah. Young people, maybe they don't want it anymore. Yeah. But still the, the like, United <coughs> States supports Saudi yeah. Arabia. Yeah. Russia supports Iran. So even if the young people try to get out of it, they will, they will not be able to do it because it's too strong because the support yeah. of yeah. the, the, sta the, the, the big yeah. states like United States, Russia, China. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's no doubt, you know, that uh, historically in terms of a philosophy of history that the Slavic world, Russia, and the American world have moved into the foreground of history in the First World War, but in the Second World War, they occupied uh, occupied Europe and so on. Mm -hmm. And they are in every conflict around the world. They are, you know, they are not only Iran. The uh, the Americans still have an airport in in Russia, have an airport in Russia for which they fly to Afghanistan and so mm -hmm. on. They have all kinds of things in common and so on. And I think that at the moment, you know, the American foreign policy is utterly confused because they do not understand what is going on. But what is worse, they do not understand who they are. For instance, the United States thinks they are a religious country. Mm -hmm. Certainly the economy is not religious. The polity is not religious. They are pragmatic, you know, they are not guided by a Christian ethos and so on. I mean, Bush may say, Sermon on the Mount, love your, love your enemy, and then they bomb them all to pieces, you know, and kill one million people in Iraq and so on. So uh, the, um, it is not a Christian country. They are Christian elements. For instance, you can see in America that somebody pats the other one on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, that is some kind of a Christian gesture. Or that they call each other by the first name, which they don't do in Europe at all. You know, That is somehow a Christian, like Christian brotherhood. You know? So there are certain elements there when you um, called policeman, you know, and you, he wants to write a, something out for you and you smile at him, he says, well, I let you go, you know. That. So there are these residuals of Christianity. There are Carter, for instance, you know, it's President Carter is a, is a real Baptist, is mm -hmm. a real religious person. Obama has converted, but one doesn't know what came of it. Or what. I think he wants to do the best, but uh, at the moment he has no plan. He has no strategy or whatever what to ISIS, and ISIS is not understood. It's not understood that ISIS has an idea, and that ideas of the Caliphate of Damascus and, Af and, and, and uh, Damascus and, and uh, Iraq, uh, Iraq uh, that that these are very powerful. Mm -hmm. that these ideas, romantic as they may be, can be very powerful, and that you cannot bomb them into the Stone Age. And that the more martyrs you produce, the more stronger the idea becomes, you know. Mm -hmm. Because if we were still a real religious country, we would know how powerful religious ideas can be. So there must be another way, you know, that brings us back how we can develop an enlightened Christianity or enlightened Islam who would say, look, that is what the Europeans did, you know, they developed this type of a state which is no longer Christian or which is no longer religious at all, like here, Western Michigan University is a state university. Mm -hmm. You don't see any religious symbol whatsoever. And when I go, you know, and take my students to the mosque or whatever, I have to be careful. Nobody must be forced, you know. We always have the, the law, the constitution above us, you know, I take them to the Christians or wherever. So, um, but that was the only way how civil wars could be avoided. You asked in the beginning, you know, how can we end that? So mm. I think it can be ended only when the is an enlightened uh, Islam can understand what happened in Europe and how they solved it. Yep. And if there is a way to do something similar. So the idea of democracy, for instance, you know, I mean, totalitarian, I mean, dictatorial regimes or whatever, the question is, you know, is that a value which Islamic people can embrace? And this is the problem. Even if Islamic people 
accept this. Mm -hmm. They can't change it because their government is supported by a great nation. Yeah. Th their government is very powerful yeah. because of this support. Yeah. And this is that's right. But this see, is it, yeah. not ethical support. Yeah. Like, I, if I uh, I here in the United States, I believe yeah. this is uh, I believe in, in a secular thing and in democracy. Yeah. How come I support regime? Yeah. yeah. He, he, he don't believe in those things. Well, a dictatorial regime. You see what and this happened in Saddam, like yeah. back in 1991, yeah. when the people of Iraq tried to make a revolution against yeah. them. The United States did not support them yeah, because right, they yeah. tried to keep yeah. him to, to make the power. So that has, power. that has something to do now with, with the West, you know. They colonized the whole territory, you know. Uh, Saudi Arabia was one of the countries which freed itself from this colonialism mm -hmm. first and so on. So, but after they uh, gave political independence to these states in Africa and the Near East and so on, they kept still economic control, you know, and, and uh, so, and in order to keep that economic control, they supported all these dictators along the North African coast and in the Near East. They represented their interests. Sometimes they got out of control, mm -hmm. like Saddam Hussein there was uh, marching into another country. He was not supposed to do that. But, um, and there was mis misunderstandings too or whatever. But then when the Arabic Spring came, you know, and these, uh, these people wanted to have democracy, really, the West did not really know what to do anymore because these strong men, you know, represented their interests in all these territories mm -hmm. by uh, appearing politically independent and at the same time remain uh, economically controlled. And so why the confusion is now, you know, they hold on to the last strong man still. But I think that has no future neither, you know. So, sure, yeah. And uh, the West must learn, you know, what they uh, learned in, in, uh, in Vietnam, you know. Um, now, today, they buy rubber from Vietnam, you know. But they had to kill two million Asians first, you know, in order to find that out. What is wrong with trade? instead of war, you know. Mm -hmm. so, um, and, and so the West has to learn that they don't have to own two-thirds of the Iraqi oil wells, which they do now. They will go up in flames anyway. So why not having a, a trade relationship rather than these war relationships? So the West has to change too in all of this, you know. It's not that the West is right and the other people are wrong or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, there are everybody who wants to critique other people has to critique himself. Yes. Only a Westerner who critiques his own civilization has then also a right to say, can we not make some changes there too? Would you agree in discourse, you know? Okay. So um, I think, you know, as a principle of our theory there, there will be no peace among nations without peace among religions. And there will be no peace among religions without them talking with each other. And they cannot talk with each other if they don't know about each other, about their orientation of action, their ethics, but also about their, uh, their thinking about uh, reality, what it's all about, if finite life is all there is, or if there's more than this, and so on. So the interpretation of reality and the orientation of action they must know of each other what they hold on to, and they must respect this. This can be the beginning of creating a global ethos. That means, do we have some principles? You should not murder, you should not torture, and so on, on which we can agree. So, so in this case, let's assume we, this talk, your talk will go to the young people right yeah. now in the Middle East. Yeah. What are your uh, advice to them? Like they, they, yeah. they there, there are some people who try to kill them, whatever the people yeah. is, and they are here with other group, yeah. this group try to fight the other group. Yeah. So what are they supposed to do? Well, the first thing is, you know, we had that, our youth here was in upheaval in the 60s and 70s, and I was part of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It is necessary to know where one is. That means they have to study uh, where they are, you know, what their regimes are, mm -hmm how undemocratic or whatever they are. And they have to see also what happened in the other religion, what happened in the West. And um, it is the, the idea you know, if, of Marx there, 
um, you know, we have interpreted history, it's time that we act now. Mm -hmm. After the action didn't work, maybe it's good again to consider, right, to think. So I think that thought is something very important in the whole process, you know. Okay. And that if we cannot talk, we will have war. Even in the family, even in marriage, mm -hmm. if you cannot have a discourse, you will have war. If she says, honey, we have to talk, and you look at the football game, you know, and say, it's all right, you are divorced already. And the same thing happens, you know, in, in between nations too, you have, and between religions as well. So the youth has to learn to discourse, first of all. Whatever means we use, even the, uh, you know, the computer or whatever, mm. uh, that they learn to talk with each other, but they also have to see what happened, the breakdown of the Ottoman Empire and so on, and the Western colonialism and, and, and so on, um, and must know exactly, which is sometimes very hard, what their local situation is, what their own country went through and so on, and how we got to this situation, and uh, so make a time diagnosis, a time prognosis, you know, the future, um, to get rid of enemy images, you know, the West has an enemy image of Islam, Mm -hmm. but also to get rid of ideal images, you know, that we idealize the other side or ourselves, but somehow a future image of how an enlightened Islam, enlightened Christianity, enlightened Judaism and so on, could cooperate with each other. Is Israel a theocrit theocritic state or not? Well, they don't want to be, right, but there is on the right wing of the Knesset, Okay. There are smaller parties who are theocratic. That means who want to go back to an older um, paradigm of Judaism, which, mm -hmm. by the way, ISIS too, you know. Right, so, and there is something again. very dangerous. If I, in my 80s, want to be 18 again, it will be catastrophic, you know. <laughs> so the same thing, you cannot, in history, you cannot go back. People say everything repeats itself. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Um, even when we have repeated depressions in the United States, every depression is a new one. The 2008 depression was different from the 1929 depression. It's, uh, it's simply not, so nothing repeats itself, really. So, um, therefore, we have to be open for the new, for new possibilities. So, not an enemy image of the other, but also not an idealistic type of an image of the other, which would be disappointed, but a future image of the other. What can the youth there, what is attractive to them? So when they come to the West, those who come to the West, you know, okay, science, technology, that's attractive, you know, but also maybe rights, human rights are attractive. And if you take a concrete one, the freedom of speech, for instance, mm -hmm. there you see the danger right away. I think we are proud that we have this freedom of speech. I think sure. we should have the freedom of speech. I have colleagues who go so far that they would even let fascists have the right to speak here. Jews who would allow mm -hmm. fascists to speak. So holy the freedom of speech is. But what we don't see sometimes is that we cannot absolutize it. Whatever you absolutize, reason or faith or whatever, becomes dangerous. So also the freedom of speech is limited. You cannot call in a full theater fire and produce a panic and so on. Mm -hmm. So maybe in Paris or in Denmark or whatever, you should not uh, make pictures of Mohammed. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have pictures of Jesus or whatever, uh, this kind of pictures, you should not do that. Then to say, but we have to show them that we have this freedom of speech, you know, and then even put more uh, uh, stuff into, uh, you know, make, it, uh, make the fire, uh, more oil into the fire. That is stupid. But still... There you see what I mean, you know, yeah, with I understand, yeah. appreciating... But the reaction is, is also not, is not acceptable. Like, no. even if, if you come and make a picture for Muhammad, yeah. by a Muslim, it's not acceptable to come and try to kill you. Yeah. That's happened in the okay. United States like, yeah. Yeah. months ago. It's not acceptable. Yeah. Okay, right. say so I, I okay. refuse that. Yeah. Done. So, I reject this. Right. Done. So, see, we see it on both sides. We call that a dialectical attitude. One mm. has to have a dialectical attitude. The freedom of speech is a good thing. We want to embrace it, but it can go too far, and then it becomes destructive and bad and so on. So then we have to stop it, but what are the means to stop it now? 
Certainly not violent would not be the right means mm -hmm. to do it, right? But there would be legal ways to do it. And so we have them. You cannot shout fire in a crowded theater. So there are limitations. And this is true for all our rights, you know. <coughs> Finally, Dr. Seiber, let's assume I'm, I'm a, a believer. I believe mm -hmm. in this type of religion. And I believe this religion is true for, for any reason. Mm -hmm. And I would like people to know more about this religion. What is my better uh, situation, secular state or theocratic state, and why? Well, this is a very important question. That means, can you as a believer grant a relative autonomy to the world out there, a relative autonomy to the family, that the family is not under priestly control all the time, mm -hmm. that the Pope does not go into the bedroom or whatever. There is a certain autonomy where the marriage partners determine themselves. Autonomy means you give yourself your own law. And the same thing is in economics. It has its own laws. Engineering has its own laws. Mm -hmm. And there is a place where religion then should step back and say, you follow your own rationality as an engineer or as a politician and so on and so on. Is that possible, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, is he, Which better for religion to continue? Well, there are things in religion, you know, where this autonomy of the world is not taken seriously. Mm -hmm. Where the world is just something to be redeemed, for instance, you know. Or um, where it is unclean. Sometimes in, in the Torah, you can see uh, sacred and profane is almost like clean and unclean, you know. And mm -hmm. so like pigs are unclean and they are secular. Or mm -hmm. whatever. So there is not a sufficient appreciation of the value of the secular. Then we use electricity, which is modern and secular, mm -hmm. the cars, we have heart operations and so on. But then we condemn the whole thing, you know. Make no sense. And no, that <laughs> makes us into hypocrites, right? Yeah, exactly. All our fundamentalists have that. So, but this is what we really have to think about, you know. Can a, a believing a Christian or Islamic or Jewish person accept the uh, differentiation of the different spheres of life, of art, for instance, that you give an artist a certain freedom to write the satanic verses or whatever. Mm. See, if you have, don't have this differentiation, then you will try to kill that guy. But if you have the differentiation and say an artist has a certain freedom of imagination, we know it's not history or whatever, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it is beautiful the way he writes it and so on and so on. That is what I mean, that the realm of art has been differentiated out and the clergy should not be, Christian clergy or Islamic clergy should not be in control of this or be able to condemn him to death or what for this. So the same way philosophy has its own dimension, you know, that you mm -hmm. can think freely and so on and so on. So I think that is an important, to remain a believer and committed to it honestly. Maybe not literally that you take every word now and so on. That is a question, you know of higher criticism. The West calls that higher criticism. So every word of the Torah has put under the magnifying class, you know, mm. every word of the New Testament, what Jesus said and what he did not really say, and so on, and so on, and so on. Should that happen to the Holy Quran, and so on, you know. Let me give you an example. Do you lose your faith when you go through higher criticism? No. Give me an analogy. You are musicologist, right? You study music. Mm. You look at Beethoven, you know. First you listen to Beethoven naively, and you say, beautiful music, and so on. Then you become a musicologist, and you look what mistakes he made. Is exactly. it that is too fast, you know, should be slower, and so on. And this, this, is this, what I, I, yeah. this is what some Muslim scholars call, this is the true belief. When you start questioning your belief, right. you will reach the true exactly. belief. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah. you, you right. just... Follow it without knowing right. nothing about it. So you, you may lose the naivete of the beginning, but maybe there is a second okay, one. Yeah, yeah. You go through the critique, you know. You know now all the mistakes which Beethoven made, but it is great music after all. And you enjoy it now, knowing what techniques he used even. Mm -hmm. You enjoy it much more than you did with a naive way.
<laughs> so, see, the fundamentalist is not a bad person. The fundamentalist is somebody who is shocked by the modern enlightenment. He thinks he loses all ground, you know, all basis nice, to yeah. stand on. And what should he tell his children, you know, about pre and sex and all this? So then he goes back to the fathers, you know, and uh, reads it literally, which the fathers never did. But it is fear, you know. So what we would tell him is just go through the process. You cannot stop it anyway, you know. Mm -hmm. If you once have started the enlightenment in your head, you cannot stop it anymore. So therefore go through with it and trust, you know, that your faith is strong enough that it will survive this critique, right? right? And what comes out on the other side will be an enlightened Islamic person, or an enlightened Christian, or an enlightened Jew. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks.